All right. So we have so far, if I am not mistaken, we have been talking about the three main goals in macroeconomics, right? Uh, the first goal uh, it was, is full employment, right? First main goal, full employment. So if I have my way as uh, the president of the United States or as the head of the uh, Federal Reserve, if I have my way, then there is a job available for everybody who wants a job, right? Okay, and that the only reason why somebody should not have a job is because they're between jobs or because they're trying to get the skills that they need to get the job that's available for them, right? All right, so that makes me happy. If my economy is in full employment, the second thing is price level stability, okay? Level stability. All right, and that means that there is some inflation of prices, but not very much. I am okay with about 2% to 4% inflation. Class. Seniors, please report okay. to your A3 class. Thank you. So price level stability is associated with the measurement of inflation. Okay? And uh, Michaela, I think you didn't get these. You got, oh, you did? Okay, good, awesome, all right. So price level stability, so inflation is okay. I just don't want inflation to be 7% one year, 1% the next year, 5% the next year after that, then 11% the next year. I want very, very, I don't mind inflation. Inflation is actually good for the economy. I just don't want a lot of fluctuation in inflation, okay? Similarly, the way we measure full employment is by the unemployment rate, which we talked about. Which, by the way, I put a video on my page that I'm gonna tell you about in a little bit. Um, uh, and you'll be able to watch a video on, remember the worksheet I gave you on the unemployment rate? Uh, so I, put, I did about a 15 minute video where I went over some examples of calculating the unemployment rate. So. I'm happy as, let's say, the Secretary of the Treasury in the United States if the economy is near or at full employment and if the inflation in the country, if the price level is very stable. So inflation is just ranging between 2 and 4%. In fact, can we look at, if you happen to have it, I'm going to grab that, the, remember the Consumer Price Index that I gave you? Look over the last several years. Go back to, um, we'll go back to 2000, gosh, we can go back pretty far. Right around 1992, look what happened, man. Right after 1991, something good happened in 1992. And I really hate to say a lot of people get, I don't care, but a lot of people get real upset that that happened to be when um, Bill Clinton became president of the United States. Not that he had everything to do with this, but he did care a lot about the economy. Um, 1992, 3% inflation, 1993, 3%, then 2.6%, 2.8%, 2.9%, 2.3%, 1.6%, 2.2%, 3.4%, 25 1.6%, etc. The only time we really had a rough time was in 2009 where we had deflation, which is not really good. We don't want negative inflation. We, we, want, we want to be on the up and up. And we'll talk later about why deflation is not a good, actually we'll talk on Monday about why deflation is a bad thing for the economy. We do not want the price level to go down. We want it to rise slowly at a steady rate. That's the best thing for, well, we found that's the best thing for our economy. So you can see the United States has been pretty successful at price level stability over the last, uh, you know, 20, 30 years, it's about 20 years. Okay, so we're real happy that over the last 20 years or so, we've had some really good stable price level. All right, now the biggie, the third one, the third big goal, the one we care about, the Mac Daddy. This is the one that, yes, I just said that. I'm, I was born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s, and was still alive in the 90s. Okay, the, is economic growth. Economic growth, we care about that more than anything else. Here's the thing. You can't really have economic growth or good economic growth unless you have these two things also. 
That's one of the reasons why these two things are, are so important, is in order to have good economic growth, you have to have decent price level stability and you have to have a, a relatively low level of unemployment. Okay? So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about economic growth, how we measure it, um, what is included in the measurement, and what is not included in the... Well, let's just do it instead of me talking about what we're going to do. All right, we're going to talk about economic growth. That's what today... And actually, we're going to... Today's lesson is actually going to go today and Monday. We're not going to get through the whole thing in one day. That's how big economic growth is. So, economic growth... All right, so what is economic growth? Um, any, any thoughts? Nothing off the bat? No. Don't ask me, Mr. Ryan. All right, economic, you, you have to know it, but you don't have to answer it. All right, economic growth goes like this. Remember how I said that, remember how I said that one of the main goals of economics is consumer satisfaction? Right? We want people to have satisfaction in consuming things. Right? We don't want to be obsessed with consumption necessarily. You know, we don't want to necessarily be materialistic, though probably most of us are materialistic. Um, we don't necessarily want to be materialistic, but we do want to be what we call happy. Now, that's to me an oversimplification, but the idea is that we are satisfied. You know, we, are, we do not really have a want for anything. We have the food we need, we have the shelter we need, we have the job we need, we have transportation. Every once in a while we get to have a little bit of fun. We get education, and much of that education we get for free, right? That is, these are all things that satisfy us, okay? So if consumer satisfaction is the usefulness or the happiness that people get from using goods and services. So, couldn't one argue that the more and more and more goods and services that you have in the economy, the more satisfaction people will have overall? Is that reasonable? Okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel, but does that make sense? Okay, you know, if I have enough money to go see one movie and drink one soda then in, in a week, then if I get to go see two movies and drink two sodas in one week, now my life is a little more enjoyable. Does that make sense? Okay, if I can own one car, what's that? Say it one more time. Yeah, third period, yep. If I can own one car and drive it to work and drive it to the store, but if I can now have a second car for fun, right, isn't that, wouldn't that mean that I'm probably more satisfied than I was before? I don't want to have a philosophical argument over whether material things make people happy, but if you go from nothing to something, do you think you're happier? Probably, right? There's arguments about whether going from happy to happier, eh, maybe, I don't know. But the truth is that, you know, when you have a little bit more stuff, so what does it mean to have more goods and services available in the economy? That's economic growth. Economic growth is the production of more, I'm just going to put the production of more goods and services than, than when, than before. So, if in 2017 we produce more goods and services in America than we did in 2016, we experienced economic growth. Does that make sense? Okay. If we produce the same amount of goods and services or less or fewer goods and services in 2017 than we did in 2016, then we are not experiencing economic growth. We are actually, well, I don't know, what, I'm sure there's a technical term for it and I can't think of it on the spot right now. 
uh, decay, economic decay. Okay? But I mean, I don't really think that they would, they, they, we would just say that, you know what we would technically say? We would actually say that economic growth is negative. That's what we would say, because we're mathematical people. We would say, oh, economic growth was negative 0.01%. It's like, well, that doesn't make sense. You're growing by a negative value. Yes, we went down. Okay? But you see, the thing is, in America, we usually don't decrease. You know, we typically have, even if it's only a little tiny bit more each year, we usually have more each year. So, economic growth is very simply the production of more stuff than you did before. Now, you may say, well, what if last year you produced a million stuff, and this year you produced only 500,000 stuff? Isn't that more? I mean, having 500,000 more, doesn't that mean now that you have more? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so here's the important thing that you need to understand. Economic growth isn't just producing a couple more things. It's producing a couple more things than you produced last year. Okay? So if we produced a million things last year, this year we better produce a million things or else we're going to experience economic decay or negative economic growth, right? You can just sit anywhere. That's fine. Okay. There's a, a bunch of people aren't going to be here. They're going to get here late, so I wanted to record so that they still have access. That's okay. No big deal. Sorry, yeah. That's all right. What's that? Yeah, sure. Have a seat. Yeah, today's an off day, right? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to figure through it. All right, so look. So it's not, it's, this is actually a calculus concept. I don't know if you've gotten this far yet in calculus, but it's the idea of not just five more, right, but how many more produce, so if, if we produce a million, but then we produce only 800,000, we're looking at the difference in production. Since this year the difference in production would be negative 200,000, that would be negative growth. We expect, humans expect, hey, if you were able to do that well last year, how come you can't do that well this year? Anybody think that about their football team or baseball team? It's like, look, man, you won eight games last year. Why can't you win eight games? In fact, you better win nine games this year. You know what I'm saying? Okay? If you went undefeated last year, you should be able to go undefeated this year too, right? Okay? Well, that's the way we think about the economy. So economic growth. Here's what I, all I want you to think is the production of more stuff than, than before. That's what economic growth is, okay? Here's the problem, though. The problem is, it, th is this concept easy? Does this make sense? It's a pretty easy concept, right? All right, that's not the problem. The problem of understanding what economic growth is isn't the issue. Hey, Sinai, how are you? Um, that's not the issue. The issue, the problem comes in, and usually the thing that you have to learn in an economics class isn't what economic growth is, but how do we measure it? Have you guys noticed that everything we've done so far, we had the concept of full employment, then we had the measurement of unemployment, right? Then we had the concept of price level stability, and then the measurement of price level stability by the inflation rate, right? Well, this is the same thing. How do we measure economic growth? Well, there's actually a few ways of measuring economic growth, but generally speaking, um, they, they, well, a few... There's an intermediary variable. Let me, let me give you that. What we call this, the production of stuff in a year, we call that gross domestic product. Gross domestic product. Um, and here's, let me, let me break down gross domestic and product. By the way, if anybody has, um, I was going to wait until more people got in, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys this now. If you have access to your, uh, if your cell phone has service or if you have access to your computer, um, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys use those. Um, if, you, if what you want to do with it is this. I have a website. It's, it, it goes Professor Ryan, Professor Ryan dot, yep, dot Weebly. Dot com, all right? And when you go to professorryan.weebly.com, this is just a little aside. I'm going to leave it on the video. But I want to show you what's, what you'll get when you go to professorryan.weebly.com. 
this is what you're going to see is, there we go. It's real simple. I don't, I don't get very flashy. Okay. Professor Ryan, college classes, right? Which one's yours? Macroeconomics, right? So if you go click on macroeconomics, okay, this is what you'll see. I don't have much in here yet. I don't have much in this website, all right? But what you will see is right here, Mr. Ryan's notes on full employment. Mr. Ryan's notes on price level stability. And the notes I'm using right now are Mr. Ryan's notes on economic growth. So if you want to have these on your computer or on your phone and follow along with me, or if you want to have these to study because you weren't here the other day, you can go access the notes on price level stability and you can look over this. All of the test questions are going to come from these notes. All of the test questions are going to come from these notes. Say again. Is this stuff that you taught in class? Yeah, last class I taught price level stability. And the class before that I taught full employment. So if you were in class three, you would Yeah, well here's the thing is one of the things I've noticed is that is that I go I don't go over everything in my notes. But if you had access to everything in my notes, that might make it easier for you to study. You know what I mean? Okay, so this is what, I, this is what you'll see if you look up Mr. Ryan's notes on, full, or on economic growth. You'll see these slides. And I'm not going to cover all of them, but, um, but I am going to cover most of it, okay, or at least half of it. Yeah. Yes. I just recorded it this morning. Look, same shirt, same tie just this morning. So if you go to this page, if you go to macroeconomics, calculating unemployment, Mr. Ryan, and look, uh, these are not from that worksheet. They're ma new made up questions, but you can go watch this video. It's about 16 minutes long and, and you'll be able to, that'll help you with that worksheet. Okay. D does this look helpful? I hope this looks, and what I'm going to do is you, I would go here a couple times a week because I might put more stuff up here. I might put some links to videos that can help you understand certain things or whatever. Okay, but, um, but anyway, that's what I was thinking. I'm hoping people go here during test time, get the notes, you know, compare the notes they wrote down with my notes and, 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 you know, and do better, you know, so, all right, that's that. So I'm going to pull this back up. We're going to continue with economic growth. All right. The reason I said that is because you may want to go get these notes right now and follow along with me if you wanted to. It's up to you. All right. So do that. So. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, and that we're actually getting to that. When an economy experiences economic growth, presumably overall happiness per person will go up. And the reason for that is because usually the growth of stuff grows faster than the population growth. Now there's a danger if the growth of stuff is slower than the growth of the population, then you can actually have decreased satisfaction. Well, we have more stuff, but we also have way more people. And so now way more people have to share all the stuff that we have. Do you see what I mean? And so um, now I personally, I have my own personal individual solution to that problem, but I'm not going to share it until next semester in microeconomics. Okay, but basically the idea is I think people can get more happiness out of the same stuff if they're willing to be happy with the same stuff instead of constantly buying more and more of it. It's, like, it's almost like an anti-materialistic idea. Um, you know, um, my brother got me, I played just for a little while, I played the game World of Warcraft. Anybody ever play World of Warcraft? Just curious. No? Okay. It's a geeky video game, right? Okay. Problem with the geeky video game is you have to pay $15 a month. You have to pay $15 every single month, a new $15 to continue playing the video game. And I'm like, well, can't I just buy the video game one time and play it as much as I want? So instead of playing World of Warcraft, I buy video games that you buy one time and play them for three years. So, but a lot of people get bored with a video game after three years. That's because video games should be better than that. Video games should be made so well that you can play them for three years and not get bored with them. You know? So anyway, that's another microeconomics concept. We'll get to that next semester. Okay. All right. So, so gross domestic product is the technical term and the way we refer to it, you've probably heard this phrase before. It's referred to as GDP, GDP, gross domestic product. So the word gross means a total value before taking out deductions. 
Okay? So gross basically means a total value. Domestic means pertaining to one's own country as apart from other countries. Okay? So the total value in our country, product, the totality of goods or services made. So this is the total value of all the goods and services produced in my country. That's what GDP means. The total value of all the products and all the goods and services produced in my country. Okay, and they have argued over this for years. Have you guys ever heard of gross national product? Gross national product is the old way of calculating economic growth. And, and what they counted as national was if I move to another country and, produce, and start a business and produce things, because I'm an American, they would count my production as a part of America's gross national product. Because they're like, well, it's national. He's an American. So that's a part of our economy. And then they started to learn, wait a minute, it doesn't work that well, especially when lots of German companies and Japanese companies and other companies from other countries came to the United States and started producing, and we weren't including their production in our gross national product. And so they were like, well, wait a minute. Actually, our economy is more affected by the things produced here, even if they're produced by a, a, a company from another country. And so it's, it's adjusted over the years. So the idea here is this, is anything in the United States borders that is produced here, if it's produced here, where is it most likely to be consumed? Here, right? And that's the idea, is it's produced here, it's probably going to be consumed here, therefore, where is the satisfaction going to happen? Here. And that's the idea, is we want to understand the happiness of people here. So what is being produced here? Okay, so gross domestic product. Okay, so we're going to talk about this like crazy. You're going to get sick of hearing GDP. GDP, what's the GDP? GDP goes up, GDP goes down. And it's going to get worse than that because we're going to talk about nominal GDP versus real GDP. And that's not, nominal doesn't mean imaginary, and real doesn't necessarily mean not imaginary. It's, well, we'll get to it. Okay, all right, so gross domestic product is all the stuff, the value of all the stuff made here. Okay, all right, good. So, when the value of all the stuff made here goes up, we consider that economic growth. Okay? So, but here's the problem. The problem isn't understanding what economic growth is. The problem isn't understanding what gross domestic product is. The problem is in measuring it. And almost, and most of what it is that you have to understand has everything to do with how do we measure gross domestic product. Well, one way we could measure gross domestic product is we could ask all the companies that are producing things to tell us how many things they produced, right? Okay, well, how many cars did you produce? Well, we, we produced 1.2 million cars this year, okay? All right, let's go to the the all the farmers, how much, uh, how much food did you produce this year? Oh, we produced, you know, 17.3 billion tons of food this year, right? Okay, well, let's go, to the, let's go to the movie industry. Well, how much did you produce this year? Oh, we produced uh, 347 movies. So should we just add all these numbers up and that's how much stuff we produced? No, why not? Now you're thinking, yeah, that's what we're talking about. We don't, we, they, these things aren't comparable, right? First of all, the movie theater. Should they be counting how many movies they made or should they be counting how many tickets were bought? See, that makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? It makes a lot more sense to count how many tickets were bought because that's closer to the people who were positively affected or, or negatively affected if you saw a terrible movie which has that happened to me once or twice before. Like, I wish I had ne hadn't seen the movie. Like, I wish I could erase it from my brain. It was so bad. Okay. So, uh, or how about the food? What if we shouldn't be measuring it in tons? Maybe we should be measuring it in ears of corn 
or number of oranges. You know what I mean? Okay. So Cole's on to something here. What they figured out probably early on was this, is the best way to measure this stuff isn't by how many they made, but by the value of what they made. We convert everything into what? Convert everything into, what's our symbol? Into dollars. Convert every, you've taken an economics class before, haven't you? No? All right. Convert everything into dollars. If we convert everything into dollars, then we can compare the dollars of production last year to the dollars of production this year. Does that make sense? Okay. Now it's measurable. Do you guys remember when we learned about money a few weeks ago? Does anybody remember the three, the three functions of money, or, the, or at least a couple of them? If you happen to remember. Store of value. That means that we can put it away and hide it and wait to spend it, right? Store of value. Middleman, medium of exchange. That's right, a medium of exchange. That way I don't have to have what you need in order to get what you have. Right? And a measure of value. That's the one we need here. Because dollars, because money can be used as a measure of value, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to measure gross domestic product. And gross domestic product is the value of all the stuff produced here. Right? So that means a measure of value will allow us to make comparisons from one year to the next. Okay? Have I lost you all or are you guys still? Is this making sense? Okay. All right. Not that it's easy to do, but it makes sense, right? Okay. So here's what we're going to talk about probably for the rest of the class is, well, how in the world do we measure the value of all the stuff? Do we go door to door to each company and say, well, how much stuff did you make? What's the dollar value of the stuff you made this year? What's the dollar value of the stuff you made this year? What if some business owners say, oh, what if they... They really produced $5 million worth of stuff, but they say they produced $7 million worth of stuff. Is that, is that acceptable? Is that okay? Okay, well then how can we stop that from happening? What dollar, what dollar amount should we pick? How do we find out how many dollars? I mean, we got all this stuff. We know we're going to convert everything into dollars. So we've got all the crews all the money that people spent for cruises, and all the money they spent for food, and all the money they spent for laptop computers, and remote controls, and podiums, and whiteboards, and light bulbs. Okay, we've got all this stuff being made. We've got people going to Six Flags and Disney World, spending money on services, and going to restaurants. What's your favorite restaurant, Desiree? You have a favorite restaurant? Tokyo. Tokyo. All right, spending money at Tokyo, right? People getting goods and services, right? Well, how in the world are we supposed to collect all this information? What information should we collect? Income is one possibility. That's exactly right. One possibility is income. It's not the one we use, but it is a possibility. Here's the assumption. If we just simply identify all the income taken in by all the parties in an economy, it, wouldn't that be the same thing as all the money spent by people in the economy? Shouldn't that be the same? If I spend $10 at Walmart, isn't that $10 in income for Walmart? Yeah. Right? So if we just measure all of the income in the, that happens in a year, that would be the dollar amount of all the stuff that was bought. Right? Well, what's the alternative to that? We could measure the in, all the income that's received in dollars, or we could measure the the sale price of everything. We could instead just say, well, how much was everything sold for? How much was this laptop sold for? And how much was that chair sold for? And how much did, it, how much did, uh, did you pay to get a massage? And how much did you pay for your tickets at, at Six Flags? Okay, that's the second way. That's called total expenditures. I want you to write that down because that's the one we actually use in this country. Total expenditures. Okay. The third way is, all right, this is a little complicated, but I'm going to try and. Why? Anybody have a phone on them? Hold up a phone and give me approximate dollar value. Just ballpark it. 
six hundred dollars, four hundred dollars. Forty dollars. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. But was that the actual price of it, or did you get a deal? Because wow, forty dollar phone. Okay. Chances are Metro PCS would have charged you more if you didn't get a service with them. Like, like if you go, like if you wanted to buy that phone online and not get service, and you're just buying it brand new. How how much do phones typically cost? Like brand new. Nobody ever gets them. Yeah. All right, let's say $1,100, okay, for iPhone X, iPhone X, iPhone X, $1,100. Are we ready? Let's, why? Why does it cost $1,100? What is it made out of? What's it made out of? Metal and glass and, and probably some plastic, right? Got some wires in there. Maybe you got some chemicals in the battery, right? Where did all that stuff come from? Oh, it's got software too. No, you're right. It's got software. It sure does. It's not even worth all that. It came from land, right? It all started out as land and labor, right? So at the very beginning, it was mined out of the ground, or it was cut out of the trees, or it was dug up, or something, right? And then they took that stuff, and they melted it down, or they fused it together, and they turned it into capital, right? So one company, they took the raw material and they made wires. Another company took the raw material and made glass. Another company took the raw material and made plastic. Then another company took all those things, put them together, and then sold them to another company. And then that company took all that stuff, added a battery, because another company built the battery. Then another company took all that and they put the software in it. And then they sent it over to Metro PCS, and Metro PCS sold it to a person. How many different people were involved in all that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was a lot of things, right? It, it could have been like 20 companies. Could have been 20 different companies. You know what each one of those companies did for that $1,100 phone? Each of those companies added a little bit of value. That's right. That's exactly right. So the first company took the raw materials, added a little bit of value. Next company took that thing, added a little bit more value. We call that the value chain. It's how does stuff come from the ground and get to be in my hand for usefulness? Yes. So basically what you're saying is like the phones and stuff, they're so expensive because so much value is put in. That's correct. Because they keep having more and more value added on. Now, anyone taking marketing with Ms. Shahan may understand that each of those companies, after they add value, they sell it for like twice what they bought it for. And so each time things are being added, it's almost like the, the, the dollar amount is being doubled and doubled and doubled. It's not always double, but I mean, I don't know if you get that. You know, they got to make a profit, right? They wouldn't be doing business if they weren't making a profit. But here's the thing. The thing that is finally sold is a thing that has had value added to it in several layers, right? Well, couldn't we, couldn't we just simply add up all the dollar values of all those layers? Wouldn't that be the amount equal to, to the, what was produced and sold? It should be. It's theoretically difficult, but it should be. Like if I buy something for, for $1,000, okay, I should be able to go backwards and add up, well, this company added $50. This company added $20. This company added $100. You know what I mean? But doesn't that sound kind of tedious? Why don't, instead of doing that, why don't we just add up the $1,000 that someone spent to buy it? Does that make sense? So that's what we do. The way we measure gross domestic product, the way we measure GDP, which ultimately will help us understand whether we're experiencing economic growth, is we measure the selling price, all of the selling prices of everything that was sold in the economy. Okay? So, you know, you spent $500 on Black Friday last year. Day after Christmas, you spent $150. And throughout the year, people spent another $17 million, right? You add up all of the money spent by all the people, hang on, ready? 
This is important. Add up all of the money spent by all the people, all the businesses, all of the governments. Doesn't the government buy things? Doesn't the government need chairs and computers? Teachers are right? starting to get students from Heritage and Rocktail. They'll be grabbing their lunches and taking them to class. Good. Yeah. Be ready for the Yeah, 122. Thanks. By the way, is there anyone in here who has not gotten lunch yet? You can go over to the cafeteria and get your bag of lunch and come back. Yeah, if you haven't had lunch, you should go get lunch. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so here's the thing. All right, so all the money spent by people and their families, all the money spent by businesses, all the money spent by the government, I have one more, and all the money spent by people in other countries who bought our stuff. See, when we make something here, when we build something and make something here, we're either going to sell it to a person or a household, right? Or we're going to sell it to a business, or we're going to sell it to a government agency, and this is actually more like a government agency, uh, or we are going to put it on a boat and ship it to another country where someone over there is going to buy it. Those are the four possibilities. There's nothing else you can do with a thing that you produce except those four things. Okay? And we call those things, ready for this? All right, you're going to want to write this down. So to the way we measure GDP is with what's called total expenditures. And total expenditures okay, is equal to, uh, well, let me put this up here, is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. net exports. Consumption is usually referred to by the letter C. So TE, total expenditures, is equal to consumption plus I for investment plus G for government spending plus, let me get the right, the right. Here's, I'm going to put it in parentheses. X minus M. Net exports, which is exports minus imports. So if we export $3 billion worth of goods, if we export $3 billion worth of goods, but we import $2 billion worth of goods, what is our net exports? We export three billion and we import two billion. One billion, right? Then we have one billion in net exports. Do you think that's the way it is in the United States? It's not. You know what you know why? What do you know? We import way more than we export. Which they used to think was a bad thing. But we learned later it's actually a good thing. Because think about this. We are importing the, cu the cu customer satisfaction from other countries. So we're getting more satisfaction overall because we are taking in more than we're putting out. But here's the thing is because it wasn't produced here, it's not a part of gross domestic product, which is why we're subtracting. See, and that's one of the things is they're sort of, people get sort of confused about that, right? What if we imported everything? That means we didn't produce anything. But we're getting satisfaction from all the things we imported, right? So in a way, it's sort of a conundrum. So I don't know. But we, we ha I mean, we, nobody would send us stuff if we didn't have stuff. You know, nobody's going to import. We're not going to be able to import anything if we didn't produce anything. You know, nobody's going to give somebody something if they don't have anything to give back. All right. So here we do, here, here we go. This is what we have to understand. This is your major calculation here. This is the primary way of calculating GDP. So you have to have, they have to, every year, the government has to collect numbers on. And now, do, do we have numbers on these things? Do we know 
how much was consumed? Do we know how much business in, businesses invested? Do we know how much the government has spent? Do we know how much we've exported and how much has been imported? Yeah, we keep pretty terrible, not terrible. We keep pretty detailed records comparatively on stuff that's spent. If you own a business, you are required by law to report. You have to report your income. We got the IRS, right? You have, to re you have to report your income to the IRS, however much money your business earned. Yes? Is it against the law to like, make a false report? Mm -hmm. That's why people go to prison. Yeah. You are not allowed to falsely report anything to the government ever. Kind of like with student loans. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, the thing is, there's a lot. They, see, they care very much about having correct numbers. Okay, so they don't like it when people lie to them about these numbers. But what we're going to talk about right now is there are several measurement problems with GDP. Are you guys ready for that? we still got plenty of time. Do I have you gripped on the edge of your seat? Are you as excited about economic growth as I am? <laughs> Obviously not. <laughs> That's okay. But does this make sense, though? So basically, the way that we measure all the stuff excuse me, all the stuff, the value of all the stuff made here, the value of all the stuff made here, okay, is by simply adding up how much we have spent on all that stuff, okay? How much, the, how much we as individuals, consumers. In fact, let's talk about that. What are all these? Hang on a second. Make sure I don't overlook. There's more detail on all these things we're saying in my notes. Consumption, the sum of all nominal spending on goods and services by households. For the purpose of consumption. Now, here's the thing. I didn't, I haven't, I got, I got to, I got to put something in red and in large letters. All new stuff. No used stuff. All right, here's the question. If I go out this weekend, car shopping, and I buy a 2012 Honda Civic, and I spend $7,000 on that car, okay, does that count as gross domestic product for, excuse me, do, does that count for gross domestic product for 2017? It's a good question, isn't it? Because I spent it, because it's being consumed, right? What does GDP mean? All the stuff, the value of all the stuff produced here, when? This year. That 2012 car was produced in 2012. It was already counted in 2012. And if we're counting how much we're producing, should we be counting all the stuff that was already produced? No, we shouldn't. So if things were not produced in that year, if it's used stuff, so like a house, we can only count a house that was bought in a year if it was a brand, if it was new construction. Now, so if you build your, okay, ah, hang on, we're getting there. We're, gonna, we're getting to that, yeah. This year, over the summer, a few months ago, my wife and I, we redid a bunch of the, a bunch of the uh, siding on our house, and we had our house painted. So we're not going to count our whole house as a part of domestic product, right? But what will we include? Yeah, we bought paint this year, and it was produced this year. See, that's the thing. Ah, oh, man, you are asking the right questions. No, it wouldn't. It's not included until it's consumed. So if Lowe's bought siding and left it in storage, because Lowe's is not going to consume that siding, they're going to sell it to another person, it is not included in GDP. It's not included in GDP until the final user buys it. Yes, construction companies. Now, what they will, right, the stuff they buy, oftentimes when they buy from Home Depot, they buy it without paying tax on it 
because they're then going to sell it to the person they're doing construction for. Does that make sense? Now, you know what they will? You know what they will report? The construction companies will report um, the money that they, uh, for, for their, their workers and stuff. Actually, I shouldn't get into that. You know what, let's not get into that right now. Yeah, see, that's the thing is labor. How do we account for labor? Well, by the house, right? Okay, yeah, sorry, I, I, I should take that back. If they're building a brand new house, they are going to account for all that in the house that they sell. But if I hire a guy to come over my house and fix my gutters, we are going to include his labor in that because I purchased a service from him. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. But when you buy a whole house, you are including all of the services and all of the materials that went into the house at one time. But now if I go buy that house five years old, right, it's not going to be a part of gross domestic product. Correct. Because it's a used house. It was produced five years ago. It was included in gross domestic product five years ago. Renting is different. Renting is a service. It is included in gross domestic product because it is being consumed one year at a time. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's money spent in yes, that's net exports. Yeah. Are we doing okay here, guys? Okay. All right. Um, say again. I do. Yeah. But I don't think I'm giving it to you today. I think I'm going to give it to you. Yes, before the end of class. I don't have that quite yet. I'm getting there. You, I have to give you work back, which I will give you back next week. I'm giving you your test back today, but the other things, I'm going to give you a report back next week. Yeah. All right, let's see here. We got government spending. Okay, also, by the way, we, we, let's talk about government in government spending. Um, something, what we're talking about here, when we say consumption, investment, government spending, we're not talking about used items. We're only talking about new things. And we're only talking about things that they consume. For example, is anybody here, here, okay, you have a job. Somebody tell me, anybody have a job? Okay, where do you work? Azel Studios, okay. All right, so um, does he buy, is there anything that he buys that when he buys it, he's not going to use it? He's actually going to then do something with it and sell it to the, to the customer, like shirts or mugs. What's that? Okay, let's talk about that for a second. In a second. Where do you work? Kroger, okay. Where do you work? Panera. That's right, I didn't know that. You work at Panera. Okay, so here's the deal. When he buys shirts for you, the employee, that's a uniform. Uniforms are consumed by the business. They are not subsequently being sold to customers. Therefore, uniforms will be included in investment. Uh huh. Yeah. So the IDs, he buys these plastic cards, right? He buys these little plastic cards, but ultimately he's going to sell those plastic cards to a final customer. That those plastic cards would not be included in investment. You know where they would be included in government spending. You know why? Guess who's buying all those little plastic cards? The school system is right, which is a government entity. And they're the ones consuming it. They're not going to sell it to someone else. Therefore, those cards would not be accounted for under investment. Those cards would be accounted for under government spending. Everything households buy are considered consumption. We are not allowed to buy things to sell. Does that make sense? We do, right? But that's as a private individual, as a private business. And in a way, it's actually kind of illegal. Anybody know anybody who walks around with a big duffel bag at school and sells candy out of their duffel bag or their, right? That's illegal. Now, well, hang on. I didn't say that it, I thought it was wrong. I didn't say I thought it was wrong. I'm on camera right now. I'll tell you, I, I, I think it shouldn't be illegal. You know why? Because it, we live in a country 
where they mandate in order to do any kind of business at all, you have to have a business li license. And I think that's a shame. You can be a sole proprietorship. Technically, you can do it as long as you report that income on your IRS return. And you should. So you're saying that even if you like, run a lemonade stand? Uh-huh. Um, they can come shut you down. They can say, let me see your business license. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't have a business license. <laughs> Close it down. You're in violation. Here's your $250 fine for doing business without a license. Isn't that terrible? Even little kids? Yeah, girls, they have a business license. Yeah. Uh, Girl Scouts. I'm pretty sure the Girl Scouts probably dot their I's and cross their T's when it comes to selling Girl Scout cookies. Yeah, yeah. See, that's the thing. It's technically fundraising. Um, I am not a salesperson. It's one of the reasons I'm not a huge supporter of the Girl Scouts. I mean, I'll buy their cookies. Listen, okay, look. Because that's fine. And, and, and since I'm on camera, let me say this, okay? They, pra they, they practically say you can't be a Girl Scout unless you sell. What if you, what if you don't enjoy being a salesperson? Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. Really? I feel terrible. Thank you, for, Kayla. You have just enlightened me. Yeah. There aren't any like weird troops out there that are militant about there. No, there are. There are okay, all right, all right. There are. All right. All right. So it depends on it depends on the 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 branch you're at. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Michaela, I'm sorry, I, I kind of insulted something that you care about. That wasn't nice of me. I just I used to be a girl scout. Were you? You never sold? And they were okay with that? Yeah. So then what's so then why? Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, well, that's okay. I'm okay with no money. Yeah, yeah. They use that money to win prizes, like, you know, things that they want, like bunnies and things. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. I feel really bad now. You have, you have changed, yeah, but you have changed my life. It is, it is, it's really good. You know, this is what happens when we, when we put a human face on something that we don't understand that we can, we can learn to understand and become better people for it. Is it the you know? cookies? Is that what you're against? No, I actually love the cookies, but I don't eat cookies anymore. Yeah. What? Uh, I, I haven't had sweets in two and a half years. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't eat donuts. I don't eat cake. I don't eat cookies. I don't eat any of that stuff. I do put syrup on pancakes from time to time, but I only have pancakes very infrequently. So, yeah. I do need to make pancakes sometimes, yeah. Well, no, I do eat sugar. It's just I don't eat sweets. Like something that is, I don't eat candy bars. I don't eat cake. I don't eat ice cream. I do eat yogurt. And they put sugar in yogurt, but I do eat yogurt. I drink chocolate milk, which is sort of a weird, it's like, okay, you don't eat ice cream, but you drink chocolate milk. It's milk. Yes. All right. Yeah, it is milk, but milk yeah. is sugar. I know, I know, I know. Well, see, that's the thing is, for me, the problem wasn't chocolate milk. The problem was overconsumption of candy bars, cake, ice cream. I had a problem. Like donuts, nobody eats, or Mike don't eat a donut. Mike eat a dozen donuts, okay? Yeah, and sometimes in one sitting. Yeah, I mean... If, especially if they're Krispy Kreme glazed, man. Those things are like air. They practically feel like, they see, it seems like they have no calories in them at all because they hit your mouth and they dissolve. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about, right? Can you eat 12 donuts? Yeah, see? And he's fit. Do you miss sugar at all? Maybe a little. Not that much. I make up for it. I, I mean, like I said, I have, I, lo I eat way too many like pizza and wings and stuff. That's, yeah. That's why, I, well, anyway. All right. So guys, here's what you have to understand. We got about 25 minutes left. We are talking about only, only new stuff that's being consumed. Uh, government, you know what's not a part of government spending? What is not a part of government spending is welfare payments. You know, money they pay out in Social Security, money that they pay out to uh, people with uh, financial hardships, food stamps, things like that. Not government spending. You know why? Because they're, just, they're basically giving out money that's not being consumed. What will the, the recipient of that money do with that money? 
They'll go buy something that they will consume, and then whatever it is that they buy with the welfare check will go under consumption. That's correct. Yeah. Correct. It still goes in. That's, and that's, see, and now I don't necessarily agree with the philosophy, but what they think is this. They think that they're going to make the economy better by giving away money, and, and now they're going to increase consumption. What they don't understand is that that money would have gone to consumption anyway. Yes. It would have gone to consumption anyway. Yep. So they didn't have to give it away. It would have gone to consumption anyway. So now look. Hang on. Now what does the government buy? The government does buy. Doesn't the government buy computers? That they, like all the people who work up in Washington or in Atlanta, don't they probably all have computers? Are they giving those away or selling them? No, they're using them. They are consuming them. When the government buys something to consume, have you ever seen a truck driving around that says like Rockdale County Schools on it or a truck that says Rockdale County Public Works? Yeah, school buses. School buses are government spending. They are consumed by the government unless they bought it used. Yeah. Yes, post office trucks. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Now, understand, if a school system buys five used school buses, that is not going to go into government spending for that year because they bought a used good. So All right? Go Correct. Be the reason being is, let's say it's a 10-year-old bus. It was included 10 years ago. <laughs> I don't know. I'm pretty sure most of the buses I went to school in when I was younger were more than 10 years old. And we didn't have air conditioning. We did not have air conditioning in our buses. Now listen, consider this. So, so consider this. Here's the basic idea. Can you can either write it down or wrap your brain around it? Here's the idea. When things are produced, either, either stuff or services, we never count them twice. Ever. We don't count them twice. This table was only included in GDP the year that it was made and sold. That's it. My phone was only made, it was made one year, and the year I bought it, that's when it was included in GDP. Yes. The value of the stuff produced in this country. That's correct. When it's sold, though, see, that's the thing. Here's the interesting thing. Yeah. Here's the interesting thing. If something gets marked down, Right? It's, and this is, there's probably more to it than this. I, I'm honestly, I'm actually not that much of a macroeconomist, so I don't know some of the details. But generally speaking, if you take something and mark it down and then sell it, it's only going to be counted for its value for what it was sold for. So what if, um, what if you buy an iPhone 7? Yes. Are you Nobody bought it before. It was never used before, right? It would be included. Yeah. Because up till now, for the past four years, it's been sitting in inventory. Inventory is stuff bought by businesses that is not consumed by the business. It's sitting in their inventory, waiting to be bought, waiting to be. So now you bring up a really interesting point. It was produced four years ago, but it's not going to be counted in GDP until now. That's a little weird, right? Yeah, yes. And, and here's the point, guys. Here, here's the, here's what, you're, what you are all referring to right now are what we would call measurement errors in GDP. We don't get it right down to the dollar. We probably don't even get it right down to the million dollars. We may be pretty close at the billion or 10 billion level, but we, this is not a precise number. We do the best we can with it, but I promise you it's not as precise as we'd like it to be. KP. So uh -huh. OK, I see what you're saying there. OK. I don't know the answer to the question you're asking. <laughs> right, right, because here's the thing is that additional value, that, that additional value was not produced. It was realized. 
Now, if, hang on, if it went up in value because somebody went in and painted it and fixed it up, so somebody buys a house and they flip it, right? Yes. Yes. Is it a brand new house? Oh, yeah. If it's, if it's the first time it was sold, then yes, it's going to be included. Yeah. Yeah. Gross domestic product. See, this is, this is one of the things about the error in gross domestic product is it, there are a lot. You know what? Let's get there. Let's, because we got about, we got about 15 minutes and I want to get, I want to show you guys this. I hit the wrong, okay, there we go. All right, ready? What you guys are asking about is errors in measurement of GDP, okay? And, the, and, and it refers to things that are not included in GDP. So you're going to want to, you're going to want to, know these things. There's six things that we're going to say that are not included in GDP. And because of these six things, excuse me, because of some of these six things, we don't always get an accurate measure of GDP. Not in GDP. Okay, ready? First thing that's not in GDP, intermediate goods. Intermediate goods. Okay, now, some tires are sold directly to consumers, right? You go down to discount tire, you buy four new tires for your car, that's going to be included in GDP, right? But some tires are shipped to the manufacturing plant where they put it on new cars. Those tires are not going to be included in GDP. That's exactly right there, inventory for the production of cars. It will, those tires will be included in GDP when they sell the car. Does that make sense? Okay. You know, do um, you guys have f flour or tomatoes? Yeah. Ingredients, right? We don't count ingredients. We'll count them when we sell the sandwich to the customer, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, anybody in here work at a restaurant where they have giant boxes of syrup? You know what I'm talking about? And you got to go, you got to lift the thing up and you got to pop the thing off and screw the thing on and then it... You know what I mean? Yeah. Huh? Well, ketchup can do that too. What's that? Coke machine, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. All those things, those are intermediate goods. You don't get to count those until you sell the, the, the soda to the customer. Okay. So intermediate goods are not included. All the things that were used to make my phone, not included. The metal and the plastic here. See this? See how this is assembled with screws and stuff? Before it became a chair, it was parts bought by a company. Those parts, not included in GDP. It would still be an intermediate good because here's the thing is, even though they're giving away the soda for free, they're actually not giving away the soda for free. Okay, it's included in the overall, they're, they're charging you one price for all your stuff, right? And soda is included for free. They're selling it to you in there. Yeah, it's a part of that. It's in there. Does that help a little bit? It's like when you go to college, okay, and you don't pay for every meal. Some people do, but not everybody. Some people pay for a meal plan, right? So they buy a meal at a time or they buy 100 meals at a time, right? Okay. Well, when they go in there, they can have any food that they want that's in there, right? But they bought the meal separately. That doesn't mean that that food's free. It just means that it is included in what you paid. Does that make sense? I would, in fact, if I were you, if I go someplace where they're giving out free soda, I would think of it more like, oh, they're just including the soda in what I paid. It doesn't make sense because at the restaurant, like, mm -hmm. Right. Right. However, didn't the restaurant have to buy the sodas? And if the price they were charging for the food was lower, could they still afford to give the soda away for free? I don't know, because they give it to their employees. Yeah, they're wrapping it up. They're just taking it as a cost of doing business is what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, hopefully not. Well, here's the thing is they're taking it out of employees' checks by saying we'll pay you $8 an hour instead of saying we'll pay you eight twenty five an hour. Does that make sense? It's, it's really interesting the creative things that entrepreneurs do 
to manipulate the movement of money. Is, and, and well, anyway. So anyway, intermediate goods. We don't count those in GDP. The second thing we don't count in GDP. Okay. Here's what we're going to call them: non-production, non-production transactions. Anybody ever buy a 20-year-old book on eBay? No, I have. I bought a 60-year-old book on. I actually bought a 100-year-old book. Yeah, I love books. I like old books. Yeah. It was a Sunday school book, first published in 1914. Non-production transactions. Here's a non-production transaction. Used goods. These were already counted when they were sold new. Financial transactions. Money gifts, loans, stock, and bond purchases. They are not goods or services. They are just money. However, when you buy stock, you typically pay the stockbroker a fee. That fee is a service and is included in GDP but the money that you spent to buy the stock is not included in GDP, okay? Transfer payments, welfare payments from governments to households, they're money only, they are not goods or services, okay? It has to be a good or a service to be included and it has to be new, it has to be the first time it was ever sold. So these are non-production transactions, okay? See, when you buy a five-year-old, anybody ever buy a five-year-old CD or DVD from, through eBay? Yeah, right? Sometimes the only way to get that old, you know, uh, uh, Tupac CD, right? You know, if you can't download it, I'm making stuff up here. I never listened to Tupac. Yeah. Or, yeah, there you go. All right. So, look, it's a transaction, but no production took place. Now, is the, is the postage for the shipping of the item going to be included in GDP? You betcha. Is the box that was bought to package the item and ship it going to be included? Yes. What if it was a box that was taken, what if it was a uh, baby diaper box that was folded inside out and then taped up again? Is that going to be included in GDP? Nope, because it is a, you're reusing something. Yeah. Oh, I'm good at folding, I can turn anything into a box. I mean, like you give me any old box, I'll turn it into a new box. I'm good at that. I'll cut it down, I'll fold it over, I'll, yeah. All right. Let's see here, non-market production. Oh, this is a good one, you'll like this one. Non-market production. Non-market production. All right, non-market production. Productive economic activity that is not bought or sold in a market. So consider this, my wife, um, she does not work. Um, for she's not employed, she's not in the labor force. Okay, I've mentioned this before. At home, she works a lot. She does a lot of work at home. She does. She's an artist. Um, she and I, like I said, we replace the, much of the siding on our house. Is that production? Yeah. It is. Did we record it and report it with the government? Yeah. Nope. All we reported was the things that we purchased to do the siding. But we may have done two or $3,000 worth of work on our house. It's productive. We produced something, but it's not being recorded. It's not being included in GDP. That is a measurement error. Go ahead. So, just like you said that like businesses, when they give a good or a service, it goes up into the GDP. Uh-huh. What about nonprofits? Yes. Nonprofits, if a nonprofit, it, it, nonprofits are generally considered to be businesses. They're a part of investment. When they buy a chair, when they buy a computer. Yeah, now if they were donated a computer, then that's not going to be included. Yeah, but here's the thing is, anybody in here have someone in their family that's a do-it-yourselfer? They fix things themselves, right? Yep, okay. That's production, but it's non-market production. Therefore, it's not being accounted for. So we could have all kinds of production in the country, and if, we, it, and if, it, and if it never goes to market, then we're going to misunderstand GDP. If there's a lot of do-it-yourselfers going on, then we are under-measuring GDP. Okay, does that make sense? All right, um, like my wife, she provides childcare and education for my children. We don't pay for it, but she does it. That's production, but it's not being measured. Okay, 
All right, uh, a couple more here. Underground production. All right, here's the fun one. This is the production and sale of goods that the government doesn't know about. Examples? <laughs> What's that? No, that would be a non-market production. Drugs, illegal drugs. Okay. Uh, production activity that is not reported to the government, but nonetheless provides consumer satisfaction. Illegal activity is not recorded for obvious reasons. Illegal drugs, pirated copies of DVDs and software, right? They don't report that to the government for good reason, right? But it's still production, is it not? Isn't it still something being produced and used and bought and sold? It's just illegal. And then some business owners evade paying income taxes by not reporting income on goods and services sold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's called money laundering, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's just a way of making it appear as though the money that you have is legit, but that doesn't, that, doesn't affect, that doesn't affect GDP. Usually the reason they do that is so that they can explain why they're able to drive a Ferrari, but they do not have a career. Yeah. Yeah, they make it look like they have a career so that it doesn't look funky that they're driving a Ferrari. You know? All right, a couple more things here. Leisure. Leisure. This is, this is actually, I'm sorry, not, hobby wouldn't be non-market production. A hobby would be leisure. Leisure. Even though leisure time is non-productive, it does provide satisfaction to those who enjoy it. For example, a family may spend a week at Disney World and spend lots of money, which would be counted in GDP, or they could spend that week camping for free and get the same satisfaction. So when people do leisure things, it's productive for them personally, but it's not counted in GDP. That would be, okay, so I go home, I produce, I buy some wood, and I build a fence, or I, I have all the stuff to build a fence, and I go build a fence for a person, and then I don't report it. That's, that's illegal. That's not, oh, is that what you meant? Yeah. Yes, that would be underground production. Yep. Like, like if I yeah. make a piece of art and sell it to somebody. And then you don't report it to the IRS. Well, they would never know. Well, it, right, hang on, hang on. I'm not saying that in judgment. I'm saying if you don't report it to the IRS, then yes, it qualifies as underground production. So a lot of people do underground Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and that's the thing is, underground production is probably, if we were able to account for underground production, we might find that our economic growth is actually a lot higher than, it, than we thought it was. Because there are a lot of things that are produced. Hey, you guys. All right, last one here. Economic bads. All right. We talk, we've talked about goods and services, right? I, I need you to get this word. We talk about goods, right? This marker is a good. Is that correct? You know why it's a good? Because, well, and because it does something productive. Okay? We also have uh, some e economists have, co have come up with the word bads. Economic bads. This should be, these should be subtracted from GDP. So, we build, we build a car, right? Pretty awesome, right? We build a car and then sell it to somebody and now they can drive around, right? But while they're driving around, they pollute the air, they spill oil on the ground, they um, hurt people, and what's that? No, 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 I'm just saying a person. Somebody goes and they buy, they buy a car, right? And, while they're, and then they go drink, right? And while they're driving around, they run over somebody's mailbox, right? What, what is the production of that car now causing? Damage. It's actually reducing what we have produced. It's destroying things. And when we have things that, after they are produced, they are destroying things. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
when they're if they're destroying things, then that's causing negative production right here. Sorry, man. Right up there. That's all right. You can just grab it and pull it down. All right. Is everybody okay? Yeah, everybody's everybody? fine. Okay, all right. Um, all right, so here's the thing is there's no real way to be able to, ha to manage those effects, to be able to do that. Oh, I've got to give you guys your test back, don't I? All right. We're done for the day. We're going to pick up uh, on Monday with these notes.